Greetings, folks. Nice to see you. My name is Dustin Cormier, and I am an official graduate of the Asheville Vedic Astrology Apprenticeship Program. If you want to hear more from me and my videos, check out my YouTube channel called How to Rock Astrology. I made this video as one of my culminating essays for Asheville Vedic Astrology, and it's called The Yoga of Past and Present Lives through the Shasti Amsha, the D60 chart. Uh, I made this video originally, and uh, Ryan, I sent it in to Ryan, and he passed it, but me and him both agreed that there were some audio issues that made that original video not so good for uh, to put on his channel. So I've gone and I've redone a lot of the parts in this video, but a lot of the original is still there. So I wanted to mention that that's the video that you're watching. Uh, if you are interested in being a, a, per, a part of the Asheville Vedic Astrology Apprenticeship Program, feel free to check out the link in the description box below. And you can join us and you can check out everything that this course has set up to teach you to be a Jyotishi in your own right. Thanks so much for watching. Hi there, folks. This is my second semester essay entitled The Yoga of Past and Present Lives as Seen Through the D60, the Shasti Amsha. Welcome. In this video, I aim to describe the yoga of finding constructive union with the information contained in the D60 chart, which is considered to be a past life karma chart, uh, seeing where the, potent the things shown in the D60 finds constructive union with channels of nourishment for the potentials given in the D1 chart, the D9 chart, and all of the aspects of astrology that are considered from the, the, what we typically call the birth chart. <clears throat> that includes the Atmakarika, Shatbala, Lajitadya Vashtas and aspects, etc. Now, just as a quick little disclaimer here, you don't need to know your exact birth time or the D60 log now in order to make use of the techniques in this video. You only need to know the planets and the signs of the D60. So if a fast-moving planet like the Moon is on a Shastyamsa cusp, the sign cusp of the D60, you may want to refrain from using it in a D60 reading with an insecure birth time. To check how close a planet is to moving into the next Chasti Amsta shine, uh, just use the change birth time function in Kala and just go ahead like an hour and see how the planets in the Chasti Amsha, the D60, have changed. I hardly ever use the moon in the D, uh, a D60 reading just because uh, or at least when I'm using this technique, just because the moon moves so fast. So, <clears throat> don't be dismayed, because the lagna of the D60 is its own thing, and it, like I said, it doesn't have as much to do with today's discussion. You can get a lot done just by knowing the planets in the signs of the D60. Now, these are the Shodasha Vargas. You might recognize it from Kala. <clears throat> Brihat Parashara Horashastra lists 16 important Vargas. Shodasha means 16 in Sanskrit. Now, this is some kind of background stuff. I've just got to give it short thrift because we don't have much time. There are five groupings of the Vargas given by Parashara. Each group corresponds to one of the five Panchatattvas, or the primordial elements. Pancha means five. Tattva means primordial elements. <clears throat> we know these from Ayurveda. Now, the D1, D2, D3, etc., all the way to the D12, corresponds to the Akasha, ether element. We're going to keep talking about how the ether relates to the Indriyas, the things that directly influence us, that we can immediately use in this incarnation, our potentials. And there are others, as we're going to see here in this little table here. There are other ways, there are other Varga groupings between these two. But the D60 stands alone as the corresponding Varga of the Earth element, which according to Ernst Wilhelm, shows the reality of what each of us as individuals can manage 
within the limited time, energy, and resources available to us. Parashara calls it a general indicator of karma. Now, most translations of Parashara's Hora Shastra talk about the D60 technique of Shastyamsha deities, which is important, but it's not relevant to this video as much. Uh, I'm using the Shastyamsha in a regular Parashara astrology way, just like any other Varga. Often described as a way to fine-tune the indications of the main birth chart, some authors describe it as being more. Uh, I describe it as the spine of the birth chart, in my own words, from which the other limbs branch out. In the same way that we can't move our fingers without it being connected to our spine, so in the same way, we can't express the potentials of the Rashi chart, the birth chart, Shadbala, the Atmakarika, etc. without energy being available from the D60 chart. So this is just to give you a, a hint of the grouping of the Vargas. We have the Panchatattvas here on the left. Uh, and as well, different astrologies use a pick out of these Vargas in order to describe different things. For example, in Shadbala, particularly the Sthanabala part of Shadbala, we employ seven Vargas in particular to calculate a planet's strength. Uh, the Shastyamsha is not included in this because the Shastyamsha is not an etheric influencer of the Indriyas of the present incarnation. Shadbala is something that's closer related to the Rashi chart and the ether. So the ether represents things directly involved in this incarnation. Shadbala, the Rashi chart, the Atmakarika, etc. So the D60 is more of a desire or a nature than an influence. Although this is of course important because the past life desire does hugely affect how we handle our karma. I almost consider the D60 to represent like the essence of the soul and the essence of the soul is only going to use so much of the potentials of the present incarnation. Uh, this is just more background on this sort of thought, you know. Uh, when calculating planets through the, show, the total Shodasha Vargas on the total 16, the mathematics of calculating the strengths changes to include past life influences like the D60. And this is me, you know, for Sanskrit nerds, just showing the importance of the Shastyamsha. The Vimshopak scores the strength given to each planet from, a, from each Varga. The Vimshapak scores are double coming from the Shasti Amsha compared to the D1 and the D9. So this is like, for example, when we're doing Shadbala, we only use seven. We use the D1, D2, D3, D7, D9, D10, and then the D30. And that's what's commonly used. But in what, I, what was used for kings to find out whether a person could be a king or not, ancient astrologers used all 16 Vargas. And when they used all 16 Vargas through Shodasha Varga, the Shastyamsha was given more points than the Rashi chart and the Navamsha chart. So in some ways, when you consider the whole past life, present life schema, the D60 is even more important than the Rashi chart and the Navamsha chart. So the conversation between past life and present incarnation karma if we consider the D60 as the center of the wheel, then we see that the Rashi chart is an extended limb, a branch from this deeper heart. I also like to show this. The D60 is kind of like this set past life karma that we bring from our past lives. And each incarnation will be slightly different. Each Rashi chart has different injuries, different potentials. But... Using this logic, we can consider that the life path of an individual is like a spinning top. The changing face, the changing opportunities, spins on an unmoving center that is the Shastyamsha. That's kind of how I like to think about this when, we, when I talk to my clients about these past life influences. I kind of explain that this is, you know, if a, a person has something like K2 and whatever sign in the D60, I say, this is something that you've been doing in your past lives for a long time, especially K2, because that's a past life symbol as well. So if we find a birth chart, can sometimes 
show potentials in this life which open channels to the soul's essence. So this would be the D1 is this life, and then the D60 is the channel for the soul's essence, or we should say it is the soul's essence. Sometimes we find the D1 in the Rashi has an open channel for the potentials of the D60's soul essence. For example, we see a Leo rising here. They've got the sun exalted in Aries in the ninth house. And if there was no afflictions, <coughs> and we happen to see that we've got Rahu in Leo in the D60 chart, that Rahu, there's a Rahu here that's an old, old, old pattern of being too stuck in Aquarius, too stuck in Saturnian ways. And it's trying to open up to the joy of the Leo, of the vital soul. Then what we see here is that the D60 chart, which has Rahu and Leo, there's clearly, in a simplified way, an open channel, an open door for these the soul desire of Rahu and the D60, because this is a Leo rising with the sun exalted in Aries. Now, of course, you know there are times when, even in this case, a person might have debilitating things that ruin that. You know, this is just regular run-of-the-mill Rahu K2 stuff, right? So here we have Saturn debilitated in the chart in Aries. And it's starved by the sun, right? So this is important because K2 is the vessel of Aquarius. I mean, uh, Saturn is the vessel of this K2 in Aquarius. <clears throat> so the vessel that sustains this soul journey desire of Rahu in, in Leo that being K2, the survival patterns of the Saturnian ways. This is what the person's, since it's K2 in the D60, this is what they've always done. And this Saturn is being obstructed by the sun. And the Saturn is also obstructing the sun as well. So we would need to see other confluent factors in the chart to, in order to determine the pressure points that could keep this person's Saturn stable while they tried while they surrendered to the joyful rahu in leo through that exalted sun right so this is again this is typical rahu k2 stuff but that that you might be familiar with but the concept of the past life of the d60 is giving another dimension for example now let's consider that this person's rahu in the d1 chart is in capricorn so now this person's present Rahu is in Capricorn, which is obviously something that they need to work on and move towards. What's more is that, for in this case, Saturn happens to be the Atmakarika. So all of a sudden, you, we might have thought from the previous part that, you know, since Rahu in the D60 is in Leo, obviously this person, through their past lives, have been trying to develop upon the Leo and the solar sun principle. But now we see that this has to be combined in a way and balanced in a probably a painful way with the necessary Rahu of the present incarnation, which is ruled by Saturn. And we can see that Saturn is with that sun uh, as well as the Atmakarika. So if this person just is all about that Rahu sun in the D60, which might be hard for them to do. They're probably going to be more inclined to do the K2 Saturn thing. You know, there's a help here because the K2 past life principle is helping that Rahu and Capricorn. But it's hindering something that's very important to this person. Something that the soul has been yearning to do lifetime after lifetime. So if the Leo sun, if the Leo rising only focuses on the sun, then they're going to burn out this present incarnation's Rahu principle. And then they won't be able to fulfill the Atmakarika's desires, which of course is just an impossible state of affairs. So in this example, the D60 Rahu does not find an easy constructive channel in the life of this person. So that was kind of, you know, like that was a real condensed gumball of what we're gonna be talking about in this video. Now, that was a lot. We just explained the purpose of the video. 
let's reel back and kind of look a little bit from the beginning and come into what we're going to be talking about ultimately in this video. As we can see, this is my video breakdown. First thing we're going to talk about is the concept of confluence. Second thing is going to be talking about double resonance, which means confluence between the past and present charts, where there's similar themes, similar Rahu principles coming between the D60 and the D1 or the D9 and what have you. Now a mixed resonance means there's no confluence between the past and the present incarnation. Finally, in the end, what we're going to talk about is how do we define whether a double resonance is auspicious, meaning constructive, or inauspicious, meaning debilitating. First of all, what is confluence? Well, everyone knows what the word influence means. Confluence includes the same root as connect, conduit, concourse. It means confluence is when many energies or influences or forces converge through the same archetype. Now, confluence shows an emphasis, which means either you know strength or weakness. And it's fun to talk about that, but it doesn't always help to heal the soul. Uh, confluence can even show familiarity, and that's a for better or worse thing. For example, a Leo rising with K2, oh, sorry, I just got to check if I'm good here, yep. A Leo rising with K2 in Aries in the D1 is likely very used to using that Mars determination uh, to, to, to get their goals done. And this aids the log now because Aries and Mars are friends and they have an affinity to Leo. However, is this strength, is this past life familiarity useful in this person's journey towards Libra, towards developing social harmony? Again, this is more regular Rahu Ketu stuff. Now, with regards to Rahu and Ketu in past versus present lives, confluence generally shows imbalance. So the rest of the chart, especially the lords of Rahu and Ketu, are going to show whether that imbalance can be brought into harmony and how they need to be brought into harmony. <clears throat> now, what kind of conversations can we expect to kind of come from this? <clears throat> uh, for a little bit of clarif clarification here, again, the D60 is the Earth Tatva Varga. And it's considered to relate to the past karma that we bring from previous incarnations. All of the ether tattva vargas, that's the D1, D2, D3, etc., combine to make up what is considered to be the indriyas, the present incarnation's energy. Now, I emphasize the D1 and the D9 just because that's generally what other, that's what most astrologers do. The D2, the D3, D4, etc., are like the limbs of these more emphasized and primary charts, the D1 and the D9. Now, sometimes it happens that a person's present karma is cast from the same... I'm going to put this this way. Sometimes a person's present karma is cast from the same groove as the ancestral energy of the D60. And this is what we're starting to talk about with the concept of double resonance. And that's why we've got double resonance is what we're talking about now. So for example, if you have K2 in Aries in the D60 and K2 in Aries in the D1 chart, then we can conclude that the same energy from the past life has found an open channel for the same expression in the D1, in the present life, in the potentials of the indrias of the present life. On one hand, this gives greater emphasis on a past life which has been fueled by the one-pointedness of Aries. Uh, but this also makes it harder and possibly more rewarding to employ the Venus-Rahu axis of Rahu being in Libra. So we would look to the K2 Lord in this case to see if the vehicle of transformation is stable. In this case, that'd be Mars, because both of these K2s are in Aries. Whether it's stable or not, the client will still be wanting to get away from it. Because, of course, K2 is a dissolving vehicle of transformation. Uh, it's, it's like a raft crossing a river. 
Once you have used it, you want to throw it away. <sighs> now this was what I call double resonance on the same archetype. We're going to talk about how there's other factors. It's not just about having K2 in the same sign. You know, if this person was a Scorpio rising or Mars at Makarika, this person is Mars at Makarika. So there'd be even more confluence. And we're going to start breaking down all the degrees of confluence. But first, let's talk about, <clears throat> I guess I should say, double resonance is easy for us to comprehend as astrologers because it's all very simple. It's always nice when you get a double resonance chart. When someone's Rahu or Ketu is in the same sign in the D60 as it is in the D1 or the D9, then you can see that this will be something that is probably very important to this person. Uh, although, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy to give them a remedy for it. This will provide insight into a pain or a glory which, for better or worse, may be unavoidable to that person. So mixed resonance is where the past life, the D60, is somehow antagonistic or neutral to the karma of the Indrias of the present incarnation, so the D1, the D9, Shadbala, etc. So an example of mixed resonance, just so you get the picture of where I'm at here, is just simply when Rahu is in signs that do not necessarily relate to each other. We're going to talk more about that. Now, I would really recommend that everyone observe the licentiousness that I give to this concept of confluence. There's much room for play in determining confluent factors in a chart. The key, I would say, lies in numerology. The signs, for example, correlate with numbers. The houses relate with numbers. And the grahas also correlate with numbers. Practice your intuition as an astrologer. Never be afraid to ask the client to affirm when you, whether you sense and whether they sense the same energetic bias in their chart that you have an eye on, right? Because ultimately, we're not here to tell people what their energetic influences are. We're here to affirm, to be a mirror for them. They Let them be your guide. Now, I'm going to reiterate this point just because uh, it's an important point to keep in mind. Again, we remind you that you don't need an exact birth time to find confluence using the D60 with the rest of the Vargas. It's rare that you'll find an exact birth time of a person. And even when you do, it's still recommended that, you know, it can, it can still be rectified. Uh, so we don't want to use the house cusps of the D60 unless it's been rectified because the house cusps can change within 30 seconds of a birth time. So let's take a little example of what we're looking at here. This is just a random chart. Uh, I've decided to pick one where the Rahu is at 19 degrees, 16 minutes of arc in the sign of Taurus. And now we're going to take a look at this simply just so you can see. This is a tool that you should be using whenever you're looking for the Rahu inside of a D, the D60. Now, we know that in the D60 chart, it's split up into 60 portions, which means, you know, typically there's 30 degrees in a chart. So, sorry, there's 30 degrees in a sign. So if a sign is split up into 60, that means a half of a degree is going to be the next point in the Varga chart. So we can see that this Rahu at 1916 is right in the middle of the, Var of the D60 Varga point. Now, what I want to do is we're going to go to change birth time, and I just want to show you guys the nature of how doable and how malleable this Rahu in the D60 is. Other planets are not the same. For example, if we look at the moon in the D60 here, we see that the moon is in Sagittarius. If we go ahead by one hour, the moon moves to Capricorn. That's only an hour. So if you've got, if you don't have an exact birth time, a lot of these planets in the D60 are tough to use. But if we notice, we'll look at Rahu here in the D60 sign of Cancer. Now, when we move ahead one hour, we can see that it's only moving incrementally, very slowly. 
one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours. So after 12 hours, this Rahu is still in the sign of Cancer. Now I'm going to go back 12, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This Rahu is back to where it was in the beginning. Now I'm going to go back another 12. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And this Rahu is now still at the D60 sign of Cancer. And this is the birth time is now 12 hours away from the original birth time. It's 7 in the morning, even if we go all the way down to midnight. this Rahu is still in the sign of Cancer in the D60. <clears throat> so this goes to show that this is a, there's a lots of room to play with Rahu in the D60, but I would still recommend, especially if you don't know the person's exact birth time, at least within an hour. You know, if you, if you, you know, if the person's birth time could be an hour or two off, make sure that Rahu is not on the cusp of the D60 Varga. Uh, you have some room to play, and this is essentially what I wanted to show here. This gives us two important points to consider. Really, the first being that you do not really need an exact, exact birth time in order to play with the D60 chart. Uh, I'm talking about within minutes. Like, if you aren't sure of the exact minute a person is born, you can still play with the slower moving figures, such as Rahu and K2 in the D60 chart. Um, I would also, the, the second point to be made here is that we, we can't use anything that moves fast, especially the Earth spinning on its axis is the fastest moving astronomical figure. So we cannot use the Lagna in the D60 chart or any of the cusps in the D60 chart or even the moon for the most part, unless you've done a concise birth rectification. Birth rectification is a hairy process. You'll have to pay somebody to do it, but it's worth it if you're interested in getting into those finer details of the D60. But for the purposes of this video and for most of the readings that I do where I use the D60 planets, you really only need to use Rahu and Ketu, for example, especially in the signs of the D60 chart. So as we move on, we're going to start thinking about, you know, for example, uh, using, observing this in your own chart and the, your favorite charts. So this is how we think about the simple theme of a double resonance in a chart. Look at your own and your favorite charts to observe. Are the Rahu points between the D60 and the D1 on a shared axis, such as in this little example, the Rahu is on Aries in the D60 and also in Aries in the D1. Is the D60 Rahu in the same sign as the D1 Rahu? And does this give more emphasis to the K2 troubles and to the Rahu soul desires? This is double resonance. Now we ask, is the D1 Rahu in the same sign as the D, sorry, the D60 Rahu? The Shasti Amsha. Is the D60 Rahu in the same sign as the D1 K2? This makes a confusion and it lim can limit the expression of the D1 Rahu in the Rashi chart. This is what we call a mixed resonance where they're not in the same sign. Although ultimately, again, it's down to the health of the Lord of Rahu and K2 uh, to define whether it does well. Now these are very basic expressions of double resonance and mixed resonance when they're simply in the same sign. But it can get more complex as we're about to find out. So how would we really consider an auspicious double resonance as opposed to an inauspicious double resonance? What's the difference? What, do they, what does this mean exactly? Usually, uh, again, ultimately, all charts are going to probably have either a, a mixed chart or they're going to have some good auspicious resonance and inauspicious resonance. So in order to go a little bit further and to define double resonance, as it's, not, you know, we, we should further define what we mean here, because it's not often that the D60 and the D1 or the D9 Rahu K2 axis land on the exact same sign. 
as in that other example where the D60 Rahu was in Aries and the D1 Rahu was in Aries as well. That doesn't often happen. So in order to go further, we have to go and talk about a certain way of organizing the planets and the signs. And this really comes down to the inauspicious and auspicious planets to the Lagna. This is something that is sort of kind of an intermediate understanding in Jyotish. Uh, and it's a subject that I go into in different ways. You can check out my Mula Triconas video to see a bit about it. So let's consider. This is what I'm talking about. There's a duality between the fire and water Rashis and the earth and air Rashis and the planets that rule them. Have you ever considered this? This is what we're going to go to in terms of a deeper understanding of double resonance. Okay, essentially, you know, just to clarify, what we're going for here is when Rahu is in a fire or water sign in the D60, as well as in the D1 and the D9, especially if it's in if Rahu is in a fire or water sign in all three of those charts, there's extreme double resonance happening there. Now let's explain exactly why this is happening. These are these two classic groupings of the planets. And you're going to see the logic that happens here. Notice that there's sort of the spirit or the inner soul, and then there's the material embodied dimensions of the soul in the external reality. You know, Venus, Mercury, and Saturn are all about external foundations, communication, relationships with those outside of us. Sun, Moon, Mars, and Jupiter are all about internal soul desires, right? Now, these are this friendship groupings in astrology. So think about it. Venus rules Libra and Taurus, air and earth. Mercury rules Gemini and Virgo, air and earth. Saturn rules Aquarius and Capricorn, air and earth. So these three are kind of grouped together. And when you have an air or earth rising sign, the trines are always going to be one of these three planets. Now let's look at the other four. Right, Sun and Moon, Leo and Cancer, Fire and Water. Mars rules Aries and Scorpio, Fire and Water. Jupiter rules Sagittarius and Pisces, Fire and Water. So these four are kind of grouped as their own soul planets in a certain way, right? So a key figure in, in intermediate astrology lessons has to do with what Parashara calls auspicious and inauspicious houses to the Lagna. There is a typical formula given for a house being auspicious to the Lagna. We won't list it here, but a short example will be useful in illustrating this dichotomy between these groupings of planets, because it does become important when we look at the auspicious houses to the Lagna. Now, there are ex exceptions to what we're giving here, but Aries, thankfully, doesn't have these exceptions. Aries is just a pure example of what we're talking about. Now we can see this is the sign of Aries up here. And these two trines, these triangles, show the letter A. The green A means auspicious. The red I means inauspicious. These derivations of auspicious and inauspicious signs from Aries Lagna are sourced from Brihat Parshara or Shastra. Auspicious means good. Inauspicious means not so good. It's not conducive to the agenda of the rising sign. And this makes sense when we think about it, right? Notice that Aries has affinity to the other fire signs, Leo and Sagittarius. The ruler of Leo, the sun, is it, its nature is conducive to what Aries is all about. You can see Leo and Aries have a shared nature. Same thing with Sagittarius, the fire signs. So Sun, Mars, and Jupiter all have a resonance. Now Aries also resonates with the water signs, especially because Scorpio is ruled by Mars. So that's Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, we can see as being auspicious to Aries. And for an Aries rising, when you have a planet in any of these, it's generally considered to be a good thing, generally. Especially if it's one of these planets in the same camp. Now, keep in mind that this is not; these are not fast and hard rules. Some Loglinas have different patterns. Gemini, for example, has three neutral signs. But generally, the first, fifth, and ninth houses, the Tricona houses, are considered auspicious to the Logna. 
and these planets between each other are considered friends, although there are exceptions again. Signs which are auspicious to the Lagna are generally ruled by a planet which is friendly to the Lagna. And we, you should know the friendships and enemies of the planets in other lessons. So Aries is ruled by Mars, and of course its friends are the Sun, the Moon, and Jupiter. Just as we can see that Aries resonates with the rule, these, those planets and the signs that they rule. Now, it's the other case when we talk about the Earth and air signs, right? Uh, we can see that, you know, but the moon, by the way, I should say this before we go, is that the moon and Mercury are the two weird planets in these two camps that don't necessarily follow these rules. If you look at Jupiter, its friends are Sun, Moon, and Mars. If you look at Mars, Sun, Moon, and Jupiter. The Sun is Moon, Mars, and Jupiter. The Moon is Sun and Mercury. So the Moon and Mercury are the only ones that are off from this general grouping. And if you know their nature, you'd understand why. <clears throat> but it's not for this video. Now, it's the same thing with Venus, Mercury, and Saturn, right? These guys are all friends amongst each other. So if we look at a Libra rising, now we can see that the auspicious and inauspicious signs from Libra rising also all resonate with this grouping of Venus, Mercury, and Saturn, right? Capricorn and Aquarius are auspicious signs to Libra. Taurus and Gemini are auspicious signs to Libra. And Virgo, and of course Libra, are auspicious signs to Libra. This is ruled by Saturn, Venus, and Mercury. Now, you'll notice again that there are exceptions to these rules. And this is, again, that's for a different class. But the general thing to note here is that there are auspicious and inauspicious signs from the Lagna. And this is a huge part of how we're going to convey what's happening when we talk about the Rahu and Ketu double resonance from the D60 into the D1 and the D9. So again, not every Lagna has an auspicious 12th and 8th Lord as Libra does. It's kind of a weird thing, all things considered. Libra is kind of funky like that. So each Lagna is different. And the auspicious and inauspicious houses and planets to the Lagna can take up a whole class in itself. But 1st, 5th, and 9th are generally always auspicious to the Lagna. You can see here Venus has friends Mercury and Saturn. Saturn has its friends Mercury and Venus. And then Mercury, like the moon, is a little bit weird and has the sun for a friend. <clears throat> now, with this given knowledge, uh, how do we further define what we call double resonance? So this is basically what we're getting at. When the D60 Rahu plus the either the D1 or the D9 Rahu sits in a sign which is auspicious to the Lagna, we can usually affirm that the chart has a double resonance. And we can kind of see this in this example on the next page. Uh, in this case, well, I'll say this too. It's the same thing with a chart whose K2 is in the D60 and or the D1 and or the D9 sits in a sign which is auspicious to the Lagna or inauspicious. You know, the point is this: the double resonance is going to sit in a, either case. So in this example, we can see that this person has K2 and Aries. <clears throat> and in the D60 chart, K2 is in the sign of Sagittarius, right? So this is a Leo rising. We can see that K2 is in Aries, which means that's kind of the birth chart laying out a certain tone. Now the D60 chart, the Shastiamsha, has this past life flavor of putting K2 in Sagittarius, which is the fifth house from the Lagna. And now we can see that there's a double resonance there. So by this general rubric, we can conclude that a mixed resonance chart is essentially one where the D60 Rahu sign placement is either auspicious or inauspicious to the Lagna, while the D1 and the D9 Rahu sign sits in the opposite camp. And you can have com different combinations of these, right? 
So this is our example of a mixed resonance chart. So we can see here that there is the D60, Rahu, is in the sign of Aries. Now this is auspicious to Scorpio rising, even though it's the sixth house. It might, we might not even necessarily 100% call it auspicious. But for Scorpio, the sixth house is ruled by the Lagna, the same planet that rules the Lagna. So there is a positivity there. There's a resonance there, an affinity. Now having Rahu in Aries really shows that there's a deep desire to use that sixth house of Aries, which is technically not a great thing, unless that Mars is well-placed. If that Mars is well-placed, it's going to get rid of a lot of the sixth house karma in a positive way. Now, this is a mixed resonance chart because Rahu in the D60 is in the sign of Aries, but Rahu in the D1 chart is in the sign of Gemini, and therefore there's not a double leading up to the same theme. It's a mixed resonance, right? This is what we're talking about. The Gemini to a Scorpio rising is not auspicious in the same way. It doesn't have affinity with Scorpio rising. Now, we could say we wish it was this simple, but the truth is there are many ways to configure this idea of double resonance. After all, the Lagna is not the only signifier of selfhood in astrology, although the Lagna and the auspicious and inauspicious planets to the Lagna is really the foundational basis for it, and it is an important aspect of this. So, defining etheric self points in life path. What is the meaning of this phrase? What am I getting at here? I'm really just talking about what we started at in the beginning, which is that the things related to one, related to the Rashi chart, all are this etheric physical life path. <clears throat> Astral, you know, it's a funny, weird sort of turn of phrase because the idea is that the Indriyas, the etheric life path, uh, unfolds our physicality in the physical world. So astrology considers the first house, the D1, all things can by the one, even the sun is considered to be the physical life path. It's the narrow gate through which all other influences of the chart must work through. And this also I would tag in with the Atmakarika. The Atmakarika resonates with this as well. Consider also that the D1 is defined as the Rashi chart which similarly relates to the physical, tangible reality, which all other Vargas must work through. Rashi is defined as a grouping. It's a, a collection of which is all, you know, a collection of the data of all the other Vargas. Anything which relates to the numerology of one, including the Atmakarika, tends to represent the etheric Atma, the vital constitution which our karma unfolds for us on this planet. All of the Vargas have to work through the Rashi chart. So these etheric self points, the self points are life path of the Rashi chart. And this includes, you know, a lot of things given in Shadbala, although Shadbala uses the other Vargas as well. But Shadbala, the Lajatati of Ashtas, we could call these the Indriyas. Th these are what we can actually use and interact with in this incarnation. It's our Indriyas, it's our vitality. The life path of the Indriyas represents the vital pillars through which the dialogue between Rahu and Ketu expresses itself between incarnations. Because, you know, really when you think about it, the D60, and especially the Rahu and the Ketu axis of the D60, shows the past life samskaras, the karmas, and the attitude which we apply to the potentials of the Rashi chart. Right? So what's this kind of look like? These are more of these, these dialogue points. Now, what you want to do when you do this, when you consider the Shastyamsha, is check whether the Rahu K2 axis of the D60, the D1, and or the D9 interacts with double resonance to any of these following important points. The Lagna, the Lagna Lord's sign and house position, also in the Navamsha, called the Swamsha. It's an important point. You know, you want to check if the Rahu K2 axis lands on the Triconas and their lords. 
You want to check if they land on the Kendras in their lords, because these are very, these interact with the consciousness a lot. Triconas positively, Kendras can be mixed. Sometimes the Kendras are positive, sometimes they have a lot of activity that can be difficult to deal with, such as, for example, for a Capricorn rising, Aries rules the fourth house, and they have to constantly deal with that emotional content. Now, the Atmakarika is a very interesting point. The Atmakarika could be a planet unfriendly to the Lagna, or else it could land in a sign that's unfriendly to the Lagna. And this, you know, really, this is almost a video in itself. You know, imagine a, a chart with pure, like triple resonance, let's say. The D60 is in Aries. The D1, uh, the D60 Rahu is in Aries. Let's say the D1 Rahu is conjunct Mars and Jupiter. And then the D9 Rahu is in Sagittarius or Leo. You know, so all of these are leaning towards the fire and water planets. But then let's say the D6, the, the, then let's say the Atmakarika is Mercury in the sign of Taurus or, you know, being opposite, you know, touching the K2 of the D60 chart. Let's say it's Mercury in Libra in the Rashi chart. There's going to be that, that Atmakarika is going against the Rahu of all three of those charts. You also want to look at the highest Shadbala planet, how it relates. You want to look at important Raja Yogas, whether they're entwined with the, with these figures. You want to look at heavy Lajitadi Avashta influences, especially. Some of the greatest work that I've done as an astrologer has just been talking about, for example, if a person's Mercury is completely starved and it's in the seventh house and it's got no strength, and it's starved by Saturn and um, I'm trying to think of Mercury's other enemies. Oh, and the moon. Let's say you've got moon, Saturn, and Mercury all in the seventh house, and that Mercury is drowning in starvation. And then let's say the K2 in the D60 is in Gemini, and then the K2 in the D9 is in Virgo. That means the K2 of the person is being starved and their basic sustainment is being starved in a strong way. This is, again, some of the greatest work that I've done as an astrologer. And you can also keep in mind the current Mahadasha Lord. There's a lot of things to con consider. Now, let's get into some example charts and start discussing how we can see what how how these figures play out in an actual chart reading i've got two examples i'm going to try to bring up today today's first anonymous chart comes from a girl of she's a friend of mine a young woman who does photography for bands uh bands like mine and i've known her for quite a while so right away we can see the atmakarika is saturn saturn is in the second house of Gemini. And there's a double resonance. This chart's kind of got double resonance and mixed resonance. You know, there's lots of positive double resonance happening with the Atmakarika, with the Lagna, and the Lagna Lord. Uh, lots of things are kind of adding up positively in that way. <clears throat> that is to say, this is a Taurus, and we know that Saturn rules. Saturn's an important planet for Taurus rising. It's a yoga karaka. It rules the ninth house and the 10th house. Now this Saturn could go anywhere. It ends up landing in the second house, which is Gemini, which is auspicious to Taurus rising. Uh, it's considered to be, a, you know, Mercury is in the camp of Venus and Saturn. So Saturn is auspicious, and the Saturn at Makarka is in the second house of Gemini. Now, Rahu is pulling on Gemini and Saturn, in a way. It's, so this, it's important for this person to build on some kind of sense of wealth and abundance. Saturn is going to make it difficult at some level, and the Rahu especially is going to make them desire to have the stability of the second house while Saturn is there, and Rahu is pulling on both of these, and they're of the same theme. Saturn resonates with stability, just kind of like the second house does in a way. Now, 
this person came to me during Rahu Mahadasha. So there is a real recklessness to this person. They were young. So she was in a real reckless period, being that young especially. But she it was money consciousness, money conscious. She had many opportunities for networking, an eighth house phenomenon, and which pulled her into opportunities uh, that could increase her career. This person was well known to be a person who could get into shows even when while she was nine, uh, even while she was 18. That's just the story of this particular person. Uh, even when she was very young, she took on lots of opportunities to go and talk with people and shoot photography for these bands. And she was developing a name as a, as a person who, and this would get her a bit of money, although she was still learning how to stabilize this thing. Uh, ultimately, what really came out of this in a lot of ways was an eighth house energy. So you've got Pluto and K2 in the eighth house of Sagittarius, the eighth sign from the Lagna, and the eighth cusp is there too. So at first, when I first kind of passed this over, it seemed to me like there was an eighth house instability that she was addicted to here uh, in a way that's not necessarily good or fortifying for her ultimately. Now, I could have, you know, there's different ways I could have thought of this. And I think many astrologers would just tell her that you got to get a stable job and a stable career. And I did tell her this. This is something that she's probably really wants and would really satisfy her because Rahu is here in the second house with, with Saturn. But I realized that this was not merely just a reckless K2 in the eighth fascination for her. You know, like instead of getting a regular job, she was going out and doing these gigs and she didn't have enough money to really feed herself as much as she could and should, uh, as much as anybody should. She would just go and rock and roll and do these gigs and occasionally get bursts of money from being a photographer for these bands. <sighs> so this would get her money for better cameras and stuff like that. And she just kept kind of flying a bit higher in this way. It was also good for her career. Now, I had an idea that this wasn't merely a reckless, strictly a reckless thing. We notice in the D60 and the, in the D9 that Rahu was in the sign of Sagittarius. Now, this Sagittarius is, of course, this eighth sign where K2 is in the D1 chart. There's a double resonance of Rahu and Sagittarius in the Navamsha and the D60, two very important charts. So this Jupiter was delighted very strongly from the sun and the moon. It had plus 1,200 points of Lajitadya Vashta, this Jupiter, by being in the sign of Leo and by having an aspect from the moon. So the Rahu of the D60 and the Rahu of the D9 both land in Sagittarius, which means they have to work through Jupiter, no matter how you dice it or slice it. And so therefore the eighth and the Rashi chart really, again, is the concrete reality of this person. So essentially the Rahu of the D9 and the D60 was working through the eighth and 11th Lord, even though the 12th house cusp falls in Pisces, still considered to be the 11th house Lord the 8th house and 11th house lord of Taurus rising. Now this person, they had a myth, mystical 8th house luck. They were interested in Jupiterian abundance and they had that consciousness. They really have that manifestation consciousness. Now what's interesting is that D9 and D60, K2 was in the sign of Gemini. So this shows a repugnance and a resistance at some level to the second house. This is what makes this a tricky sort of uh, reading. I couldn't just tell this person to go and get a job, stop wasting money and energy on this eighth house stuff, on this frivolous, you know, ways of trying to find opportunities through like an unstable opportunism. You know, at some levels, this joyful photography career and this sort of frivolous activity that she was doing 
it kind of did show that she was getting away from the the Gemini and moving towards the the openness and the faithfulness of Jupiter and of Sagittarius in that eighth house. And, you know, as much as the Rahu with Saturn in Gemini in the second house wanted stability, some level of this she needed to find a balance in herself. I couldn't tell this person how to do it. They had to do it themselves. But I did tell them that this was a resonance that you're going to have to find a balance with. Sometimes that's all you can say. This recklessness at some level, she has to work out how to apply it in a way so that she doesn't let go of an important part of who she is, but she does absorb what she needs to absorb and to become the next, to become what she needs to become. Uh, Jupiter is the Lord of Abundance, even though it's an evil house lord to Taurus rising. So this kind of leads me to this slide, you know. Auspicious arcs must be guided to be used auspiciously. Inauspicious arcs must also be guided to be used auspiciously. Right? So ultimately, it's the channel of Rahu and Ketu and their lords, which finally defines whether a chart is set up to enjoy the fruits of mixed resonance. It all comes down to the lord of Rahu and Ketu. And in particular, if you've done other classes on Rahu and Ketu given by Asheville or other Vedic people, they'll tell you that Saturn is like the right hand of Rahu and Mars is the right hand of Ketu. You can't really have a good Ketu if Mars isn't strong. You can't really stabilize Saturn. Uh, you can't really stabilize Rahu if Saturn isn't strong. Both of these are aspects of our energy field, whether we like it or not. You cannot employ one and neglect the other. And that is the important lesson here. Once this person, you know, their, their Mercury is well, is well placed. Uh, it's their highest Shadbala planet, and it's got an aspect from its friend the Sun, and it, ha it can enjoy building stability. Although it will always feel insidious, as if her youthful, reckless spirit is dying on the conveyor belt of capitalism and dusty old Saturn. They have to still do this because Rahu is here in Gemini, but the K2 in the D60 and the D9 in Gemini will always make it feel like she's not doing something, like she's not growing enough, but she has to employ it. Once she stabilizes her second house, then she can use Jupiter in that 8th and 11th house to gain more wealth, power, and career reputation, and ultimately gain even more of the stability that the Taurus rising craves down the line. So let's check a look at our second anonymous chart. This is the chart of a middle-aged woman who was a nurse. Uh, she was a nurse who was on call a lot. Uh, she was so busy with her on-call work life that she didn't have much time to actually intimately bond with people in the way that she wanted to. Now, this is a chart of a Scorpio rising who had Leo in the 10th house, or I mean, Leo was the 10th house lord for all Scorpios, and the sun is her Atmakarika. So already having the sun for an Atmakarika for a Scorpio rising shows confluence towards the auspiciousness to the Lagna. And as well, that Atmakarika sun was exalted in Aries. And Aries, of course, is ruled by Mars, which is also ruled by the Lagna. So there's lots of positive self-confidence going towards enjoyment of what one does with oneself and one's career and with one's general energy, particularly because Leo is the 10th sign of Scorpio rising. So there is the career element of this was strong. Now, this was a woman who was really on call all the time. She had all the nurses in the hospital she worked at had her number and she was basically somebody who could never really relax because there was always kind of little things happening, little bombs, not bombs, but things happening at the hospital that she just had to be on call for. Uh, at the, so this was a woman who had double resonance. We can almost even call this triple resonance because Rahu in the D1 was in Libra. 
Rahu is also in Libra in the D60. And as well, even in the D9, Rahu was in the sign of Taurus, which is not only ruled by Venus, but Taurus is also the seventh house of Scorpio, which means that D9, internally, she was seeking the experience of bonding with people. In fact, interestingly enough, because, you know, this Venus is here in this sphere. And Venus and the Sun are both kind of like starved by each other in a way. Uh, now, she was somebody who had greatly enjoyed what she did as a nurse. She deeply identified with it. We can understand that Atmakarika Sun being in the sixth house, meticulous, responsible, dutiful energy. She was somebody who, despite having this constant work energy, she wanted to bond with people. She wanted to be more intimate with people. She wanted to enjoy time that was not just viscerally work related. And in fact, what happened with this woman is that the friends that she ultimately had were work related people because she, by bonding with them, was bonding to what was most important to her, which was her career and the people that she worked with on a constant daily basis. So she was feeling sort of, she struggled, even her work and her career kind of struggled with a sort of a loneliness and an emotional wire working that was kind of creeping up on her. Now she was strong enough to get through it, but you know, she was kind of showing like, she wasn't really saying it, but I was pulling out of her like, you know, do you, how do you feel about this? Would you like to bond more intimately with people? And she would say, yes. In fact, it's something that's really something I would love to do right now lately, especially. So I told her that the things in her life would shake and suffer if she didn't have some domestic enjoyment outside of being useful to people. So what I told her is that, you know, when you think about it, her familiar ways of being in the sixth house, especially because this is the D60, as well as the D1, K2, we're in Aries. And it caused her in a lot of ways to be set with this kind of unstable career. It wasn't that financially settling or whatever, and nothing was all that stable, except that people did lean on her capacity to do what she did as a nurse. And she loved the people at her job so much that it was pretty stable. It was stable enough. Uh, although it sapped her capacity to enjoy the 12th house and especially to enjoy intimate bonding with and through others through that 12th house, through moments that are not charged by a need to be productive and constructive in sixth house malefic, you know, like um, on call in that way. And when I talked to her, we found that she could make time to do these things with other people. She's just never thought that it would ever really be that important to her. And I was telling her that your life and your career are set. Those are your bumpers. What you might find that you neglected at the end of your life, you probably won't neglect this career that you've got going on or the people that, that you enjoy with it. But you might find that you, at the end of your life, you missed out on true, deep meaningfulness and intimacy of the heart and finding people who love you and want to partner with you and be with you not because you are useful to them but because you're valuable when you're not even trying just by who you are All, ultimately the important part here is that at the end of this i asked her am i on the right track do you feel like it is important for you to bond with people in a way that's deeper than just, you know, your work friends in this way that you've had it going on. And she agreed. She agreed that she would like to have that. And that if left to her own devices, that she would just ignore that loneliness inside of her and just keep going the way that she did until she was like older. And, you know, like she might not even have a lot of friends to enjoy and the stories of all the things that she did. And she seem to have gotten that as an important and enjoyable picture for her. And this goes to show that in a chart like this, in a double resonance chart, sometimes you just got to see where the gouge is and work around it and ask the person to see if they can find ways to work within what is very much a pretty concretely given reality from K2 in a past life familiar pattern. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. 
Uh, my name is Dustin Cormier. That's uh, my assessment of two different charts. I hope you guys uh, got something out of it, and I hope you enjoyed this description of the Shasti Amsha, the soul past life nature that it represents, and how it can be applied to further understand what's going on in the Rashi chart. I'm Dustin Cormier. Uh, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you again.